everybody. Welcome. So you probably know Colin Bunch by this point, um, and I'm from the Commercialization Academy as well. Um, we are talking through uh, the 12 steps of commercialization as we see it for deep tech companies on campus. Um, and the, you know, we are now, what is it, October? We're in the 10th month of this. So the way on down the list, you are getting to a minimum viable product. And just to, to, to jump through that real quick again, the fundamental idea is that if you have a technical innovation in your lab that you are trying to get commercialized and get it out of the lab, you're kind of starting from a backwards perspective. So you're starting with a really cool solution and then you're going looking for a problem in industry. Um, and that ends up being a little more challenging. So we, we spend a lot of time, particularly in that first and second month, talking about customer discovery. Um, and then talking about how to protect your IP. Um, uh, what the hell is an IRL is trying to assess what are the strengths and weaknesses of your idea and your young startup. Um, we move on through learning about your ecosystem and folks in R2M just got a deeper dive into that and how your ecosystem matters to your success. Um, month six is talking about cash. So what are the financial fundamentals you need to know in order to have a startup? And if you're thinking about a license, again, what do you need to know about cash? So seven is building a team. What's the right team? How to outsource parts of your team? Um, what do you build? Uh, eight, month eight, I finally did the founder's punch list of all the minutia that you need to do to actually start a company. And I will say it was about 59 minutes of one uninterrupted breath. It was, it was crazy, um, but it got the idea out that there is just a lot of small details. Um, they are not as important as your product market fit, but they're all the things you have to do in order to start a startup. And it is really pretty darn hard to have a startup on the side as you're in the middle of grad school or building your faculty career. So it's you know in, in, in important to understand the commit that you're getting into if you do want to start up. Last month we talked about your IP strategy and got a lot of perspectives on that. And this month, obviously today, we're going to talk about MVP. All right, exciting stuff. So looking at our panel today, uh, we're going to have a kind of a guided conversation. We'll introduce some topics and then have our uh, expert panel talk through that. So most of you should know, or if you don't, make it on your to-do list to get to know Sally Hatcher. Um, she's the Senior Director of Venture Development at uh, Venture Partners at CU. Um, and then part of the reason I really wanted her on this panel is she's been involved in a lot of hardware startups and I think done things right and wrong and learned a lot of things. Um, John Taylor, um, who's been a great mentor for us and just helped us with R2M, one of our biggest programs. Um, he's the founder and CEO at Geekify. So this is kind of their wheelhouse. They do this for themselves, for other companies, for other startups who want to you know, create a product. Um, and he can talk about not doing it right and trying to work with clients. Um, and then Rebecca Kumerick, and I'm sorry if I said that wrong, I should have asked you before. Uh, she's the assistant director at IdeaForge here on campus. If you haven't been over there, you can see it behind her. Uh, beautiful lab, really fun space. Uh, they really live in this realm of, you know, how do you do user testing, get it in someone's hands, get that feed, feedback and iterate on a product. Um, I went to a really great pre-dotyping workshop that they did with cardboard and making a, a, a seating experience. Um, that was awesome. And they have some things coming up uh, as part of NVC. So check that out. Um, and then my name is Colin, like Sally mentioned, and I should have introduced myself. And then Sam is our fearless intern who runs all the back end, and he will try to make sure if anyone has questions in the chat, to interrupt us or keep things moving. All right, so let's just jump into it. All right, um, so just to frame this out, um, everyone's coming from different places. We have undergrad, we have serial entrepreneur mentors on this call, um, some, some postdocs and faculty who are you know, getting into their technology. And you're trying to find something that you can test parts of the market with. Not just does your thing do what it's supposed to, but how do you get it to them? Does it work? You know, how much does it cost? And so you have all these competitors that are doing existing things that are very viable, but maybe not, you know, a solution for new problems or changing paradigms. And then you have something that's maybe not good enough. This might be what you made in the lab to prove that the tech can do whatever, but it's not actually usable by a customer without you standing there and holding their hand. 
Um, with that, we'll jump into, you know, the real point of this is life is too short to build something nobody wants. Uh, I think everyone on this call or uh, all the speakers have done that. I have definitely got really passionate about something and spent a lot of time and money into it. And if you could just work hard enough, you can make something. And at the end of the day, no one, you know, no one cared. So I want to start there, uh, if I could, just with uh, maybe Sally, John, and then we'll jump to Rebecca. You know, have you ever made anything that nobody wanted? You're asking me first? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I've done this a, a, a couple too many times. Uh, this is actually why I've turned to teaching because uh, I have learned this the hard way and I wanna share this, it, it's avoidable. Um, the first time we did it, um, to give us any credit, it was during the telecom meltdown. So there was a reason that 70% of our customers went out of business, uh, but we, um, you know, we, we created something called a tunable laser spectrum analyzer. And it was a great piece of equipment. Um, uh, it, it worked beautifully, um, $30,000 instrument. And we ended up selling about two of them. So uh, with a uh, probably a year long worth of effort with multiple engineers on it and a lot of programming, there was just, uh, you know, we took quite a bath on in a direction that fundamentally the market was not interested in. Um, you know, and just to point out one other one, um, you can have a timing problem that uh, we created in 2007, a femtosecond fiber laser. And um, it was a work of art. It was beautiful in the lab, um, a, a first class, and nobody was really interested. We didn't even know what to do with the patent that we eventually got on it. 10 years later, it was the darling of Photonics West from another company. Um, and at that point we had sold our business, we had moved on. Um, but the market simply wasn't ready. So, so when you have some of these really bleeding edge, great ideas in academia, it's really important to understand if the market is ready for them or not. That's great. Thank you, Sally. John, care to chime in? I'm sure this, I'm sure this has never happened to you. We work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was such a, um, so much pain. We do a lot of replica kind of things. And so a lot of our products are things from games or shows or movies um so accuracy is absolutely a hundred percent important to some people so there are some things where people will just nitpick the hell out of this one prop that we've made or a replica uh it's like well this needs to be moved over like one millimeter to the left and this is off by this much and so i'm not buying it it's like well a lot of what we do is also custom and made to order stuff it's like even though the picture might show it this way, we can build it exactly the way you want it. Um, so, uh, and to that end, there have been a lot of things that we've created that I would have thought would have sold a lot more um, just because they're kind of a cool product. Um, like uh, we did a, a dice hopper, for instance. It's uh, If you've ever played the game Trouble, it's got the little um, uh, metal spring in there and it pops a dice. And so we did that for our tabletop gamers. So, you know, for your D20s, your D100s, like, all of your tabletop Dungeons and Dragons dice. We built this awesome arcane board filled with uh, runes and scroll work all over it. Um, and they never really went anywhere. It's like, well, it's a cool piece, but you know, it's whether we misjudged the market or people were just not wanting to spend money on that particular component. So, I mean, we've, we've got a graveyard full of interesting projects that never truly went anywhere. You're gonna have a garage sale soon. Is that the next plan? <laughs> No, we just build, uh, we just buy bigger warehouses. <laughs> um, and Rebecca, either, you know, something that, you know, you've worked on for class or how you help engineers avoid this. Yeah, well, really what comes to mind for me was um, an undergraduate student team that I worked with during the Catalyze CU program a couple of summers ago. And um, these young women had an idea of creating a, a household pitcher, like a Brita filter that would filter out hormones from drinking water. Um, and so this was an issue that they were really passionate about, but nobody else knew this was even a thing and thought that this was worth their time or effort or a problem that they needed to solve. So ultimately they ended up determining this was more of an education thing that people weren't ready to actually buy this commercial product. That's interesting. And this always point in timing, like now would be a better time for that. All right, um, and I'm sure that'll come up uh, again and again. 
Um, and so, especially for, you know, all of our technologists on this call, I want to reiterate this point. You might have seen this slide from me before. Um, the top quote is from a hardware entrepreneur that I know, but, you know, and he said, you know, we don't want toasters, we want toast. And you have to really think about and start to understand and begin to test what is the real benefit for people? What's the value proposition? What are they getting out of it? Um, and so, so many times I see tech companies who are selling the flower. It's really pretty. It's got a green stem. It's bright. But what they want to know is, will I be a giant who can shoot fire? You know, how, what's the transformation? How is their company and their life something transformed? Um, and so if you all could speak to that, just the understanding what the real value proposition is, um, and then maybe how you play that into using it and launching an MVP. Now, Rebecca, if you want to maybe go first. Yeah, you know, and one of the things that um, I commented on a couple of days ago, Colin, to you was, you know, when we um, we're doing a prototyping workshop uh, two weeks from today, so we'll share information about that. Um, that's through the Idea Forge, but we talk about instead of talking in that activity, the goal is to design a seating experience. It's not to design a chair. So the idea that it's not simply prototyping a thing, but it's prototyping this experience that this person, you know, that whoever your user is, is going to be actually experiencing. And so when we talk about the design thinking method and kind of like learning from users, you know, but just even this customer discovery, it's also reframing what you're actually coming to at the end. So you have your product and you're like, well, people want this product, but ultimately you need to determine what benefit are they getting out of this product? And like, that's the thing that you're truly, like, what are you truly designing? Is it an experience? Is it this ultimate, ultimate service that needs to be provided? Uh, there is, um, kind of a famous example of students at Stanford who um, started their project thinking that they were designing an infant incubator for the developing world. But ultimately, instead of just iterating upon existing incubators, they came up with an entirely new solution to keep babies warm. So ultimately, it wasn't the incubator that they needed to redesign. It was the problem of keeping babies warm. So they were able to come up with a whole new solution that's more like a sleeping bag that you put in a warmed um, like wax or paraffin um, little bag into. So ultimately keeping babies warm was the problem rather than creating a new incubator. That's great. John, what do you think um, getting into the benefits or what's the real value proposition of a new product? For us, that's difficult to say because we are sort of a solution for people who already, basically they are coming up with the product a lot of times uh, when they come to us. So we are the, the value add is that we manufacture and we design, we develop and we, we produce the thing. So uh, let me, hey John, let me uh, ask, when did you know that you found your value proposition for Geekify? Uh, by being a service company, our product is the service that we offer of manufacturing. When did we realize that? The first time we ever had somebody uh, ask for a custom request of anything, um, just being able to. So the product might be our product, but it might also be theirs, uh, depending on which capacity we're operating in. Uh, if we're doing our own product line, it's cool replica, cool thing from that thing you know, the nostalgia factor that they want. Um, so in the, the Mario example, the potential customer plus nostalgia product equals person who owns cool replica of nostalgia product. When they come to us in a manufacturing capacity though, it's, uh, it's them plus the flower sometimes still yields little Mario because their idea might not be that great to begin with. So our job helps to kind of trim down some of their expectations to, to more manageable things and to turn them into a, here's why it's going to flop in the market. Here's what can be done to help it succeed though. So it's, it's some counseling and it's some uh, offering of solutions and, and improvements for their own product as well. So push, pushing back on them for this. Yeah. Sally, I'm curious to kind of take a more meta approach, and I, I don't know if this is that out of left field for you, but how, you know, looking at all the teams, how do you have a sense when a team has found this? When they're uh, on, so. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, we heard this a uh, couple of sessions ago that, um, you know, the team goes out and talks to somebody and their eyes light up. 
So they start hearing that there's a shark bite need and they are able to then, uh, typically it involves some amount of pivot for the team. So it's very, very rare that somebody hears, I want exactly what you've created on your breadboard or I want your platform technology as is. That, that just doesn't usually happen. But what does happen is, you know, this, this, oh, what you are talking about is something that we really need. So that being said, you know, I mean, I, there's just so many ways to take this conversation. When I think about, we don't want toasters, we want toast. Um, th that's, that's really a problem um, that, um, take, so I, I was in a company that was making a beautiful uh, thermometer to get your basal body temperature. And what was interesting about that was, did people want a, a beautiful user experience of the most elegant uh, and best thermometer out there, or did they want their temperature? And the, the company really leaned into the idea that they wanted an extraordinary thermometer. Um, but, but with that comes an extraordinary expense. Everything from the contract manufacturing to the FDA regulation of that, um, to inventory, to um, uh, all the expense of the rollout. And, um, you know, there were, there were other ways to solve that problem. If what, the if, if what the customer really wants is toast, it's so important to think hard about what MVP really fits that need. Yeah, I think that's great. I think uh, just real quick, a personal example of not nailing this, I uh, was working for a plastic manufacturer. They developed some of the first plastic bottles. Their founder passed away. Some of the executives took over leadership and they hired me for some marketing and I gave them a bunch of marketing research and GIS and all this stuff. And I charged them about $5,000. When we got done and debriefing them, they said they were really using this to determine the future direction of their company and where they invest their millions. And they would have paid me $100,000 for the same report. They didn't give me that difference, right? It was a hard lesson learned. But because I didn't understand what they actually wanted, what they what I was doing for them, I left $95,000 on the table. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important for a lot of reasons, you know, to make sure you're charging enough for the value you're creating. All right. And you're um, really speaking to the point to me that for all the scientists and engineers in the room, you know, doing your personal work, doing the making the ask up front of really being clear on the strategic objectives or the specifications of what they want, that's going to save you profoundly in the, in the long term for actually creating a minimum viable product that meets the need as opposed to has gone in a wrong direction or undercharged. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and so this is kind of just a frame of discussion, but there's, you know, there's definitely work you can do before you launch an MVP. Um, this, that's the reason this is the 10th month of our series. Um, we talk about a lot of other things first because you need to figure it out. Who is even your customer? Um, so just looking at this, you know, have you done customer discovery? We just wrapped up R2M where most of the teams, you know, did around 30 interviews with people, you know, in the market. Um, find something that is a really big problem. Sally mentioned uh, we had what, uh, Emergy Foods um, and Ted talked about, you know, people started really like getting excited and had a different response. And that's when they knew they were onto something. Have you mapped out the ecosystem, both to understand, you know, how this value is going to flow, where you fit in, what are the other players, the competitors? Um, and then you have some idea of like what the metrics that the customers are actually looking for. Uh, it is so hard to change anything, right? Everyone's set, things are working. If they're going to change something about their business, it has to be really good. So how much better does it need to be? Um, and then getting into your MVP, now you have a testable hypothesis for what value you're creating. Um, and so I'd love to open that up to Rebecca, John. Um, you know, what do you do before you even launch an MVP? I'll go second. Do you mind jumping on that, Rebecca? I know this is kind of what you do a lot with your students. And Sorry, I got distracted reading um, the, the comments. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I think these are, these are a great summary. I mean, I really think that, that customer discovery and trying to truly understand those needs of your customers and then understanding what, um, 
to what level of fidelity you need to provide something to them so that you can continue to move forward. Because again, you want to be iterating um, as much as you can based on user feedback. Maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but you know, what level do you need so that your users or whoever you're going to next truly understand um, your product and what you're trying to move forward? And then how can you continue to move forward from that? Again, iterating and like that whole fail forward idea. Um, and you can get critical feedback, but then use that as a learning opportunity um, moving forward. Coming at that a different way, like when do you tell your students like, okay, it's time to, to launch a test now? I, I would say that we more often have to encourage our students to start small. You know, they wanna mm -hmm. go, they just wanna jump to problem solve um, and encourage them to actually test and iterate and to be intentional about doing that so that they have clear um, testable hypotheses and clear metrics of what success is, like a definition in advance of what, you know, when they say thumbs up or thumbs down on a given idea. Um, I think those metrics and things, making like a truly measurable question or truly measurable hypothesis um, that can be addressed and explored. That's great. John, any thoughts? So, man, my thought just disappeared too. It was a good one. I thought it was. And Sal, you can jump in too. I don't, don't need to put you on the spot, John. So something that we recurringly run into is that, so a lot of what we do for our product lines are, they're not really hitting pain points. They're not really solving things. They're just cool things to own for collectors. Um, however, we found that when we do customer research, customers both lie and they don't have good imaginations. So you can say like, here's this proposed solution for this thing that we've got, you know, whether it's for gaming, whether it's for, uh, you know, anything that that's more functional than it is just purely for collections. Um, and people are like, oh yeah, I love that idea. But when it comes time to actually like, put their money on the table and this, it... oh. cut out a second. We found this to be true for businesses too. It's like they love the solution, but they want the solutions for free. Um, so as you said, like leaving that extra ninety-five thousand, you're cutting in dollars on the table is difficult. Spend a hundred thousand dollars? I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what I can do about that. Let me reconnect. Uh, um, okay. Go to Sally in the meantime, and I will uh, reconnect my Wi-Fi. Um, and I think that was a great point. Uh, customers lie and they don't have an imagination could have been the tagline for this session, I feel. Um, I don't know, Sal, if you want to speak to that or just, you know, in general, the work before an MVP. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, Colin, so somebody's asking John Taylor's uh, company name, which sort of points out, you know, I'd love to have John just talk a couple of minutes about his. Oh, yeah. Uh, the company I've been citing mostly on this is my former company, Precision Photonics. Um, but uh, can we go back and just define what we're talking about with the term MVP? Because it's really different in software, hardware, and then for me in any heavily regulated space. Yeah, um, I think, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to do through the class. Uh, but finding a way to get something tangible in the hands of your customer, and it could be virtual like digital, um, that tests core parts of your value proposition, of uh, the, the experience for the user, and starting to get into testing like selling systems. How are you gonna deliver this to them? And how are you gonna get feedback from customers? Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, you can do all this research and talk to them and all these things. And like John mentioned, yeah, they might all say it's great, but until you get the thing in front of them, and have a way to get feedback, you don't actually know. Um, and so to Sally's point, you know, if you're making an online service, this could be a simple landing page with a video or a sign up. If you're making a, a widget or some piece of medical hardware, it could be something low fidelity um, that's more about the user experience, that's, you know, cardboard or pieced together just to see will this work. Um, and then in some parts of hardware or even biotech, it might be having a very clear discussion uh, framing out how this would work um, to get feedback from investors or larger pharma. Yeah, I guess, I, you know, and I would riff on that for, for just a second, and I would 
love uh, other folks to, to jump in. The chat's also quite interesting. Um, you know, my experience with an MVP is, is, you know, it's pretty darn easy to do in software, right? You can throw up a landing page, you can create an A-B test. Um, it is why it's considered relatively inexpensive to invest in software companies because you can very quickly get customer feedback on do you have a good idea or not. Um, that's incredibly harder uh, with hardware. Um, and you, 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 know, you can, I mean, if you're not in a regulated space, you can create something and you can see if your customers will buy it. Um, and you know, like I said, with the tunable laser spectrum analyzer, you know, just find out if it's gonna, gonna sell or not. But if you if you are in um, you know in a very expensive industry or regulated industry, so you know you're looking for a product that's ultimately going to cost people millions of dollars. I really think MVP means something different, and there it means getting to a a beta or a pilot project that proves the proof of concept. So the key innovation you have or the key idea, it proves it out with your customer so that they are willing to invest to go to the next step. And it needs to be, it's really finding out what that MVP can look like um, given that your full product is way too expensive for them to buy in one big gulp. So it's winnowing down how to show people the key innovation. My experience is that that can take a long time um, and it, it takes a lot of conversation with a potential customer so that they say, yeah, this is, I, you know, I'm willing to invest this much money to get to this milestone and this milestone would then be an MVP for them proving the functionality or the opportunity. Um, and it's really different again in a heavily regulated industry. So taking biotech, for example, I'm not clear that there is an MVP. Um, certainly you cannot launch product uh, if you require FDA approval. You can't launch it till they approve it. And they don't prove it until you know, you've spent millions of dollars on your clinical trials, on your validation, on your certifications. It's, it's just really expensive. So you need to be looking much earlier on for other ways to meet that MVP goal. Um, and so, as an example, my second company in biodiagnostics has done that in a very different way. We launched the product in, um, it's a point of care medical diagnostic, but we launched it first into water contaminant testing, which is regulated but less so than human diagnostics. And then we've launched it in vet diagnostics which again is regulated, but less so. So we have actually put a platform technology into other verticals as our MVP to show that the technology works, that people like it, that there's user uptake, that we have the sensitivity and specificity we say we do, so that by the time we spend the money to create a product that will sell in medical diagnostics, and by the time we make that enormous investment, we've proven out all the basic ideas for our product. So just sort of elaborating on what I think of as an MVP. Yeah, uh, John, I know you jump back in. Would you like, we're kind of going the more meta discussion of like, what is an MVP? And then Rebecca, I'd love to hear from you too, because I know you work on this uh, iteratively. John, are you back? I thought I saw you. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't get to finish the thought about um, imagination or customers not having imagination. Um, honestly, like having a visual helps tremendously and, and even anything that can communicate in an intuitive way what the solution solves is huge for people because we've had things that's like, well, imagine this solution set and you know how it could solve your problems and like oh well that sounds great but like they can't really conceptualize it whereas if you if you hand them a cardboard thing and says it does this and they're like oh i totally get it now um then you want to engage the side of their brain that's actually going to they figure for themselves how it applies to their problem because when you do the research when you figure out what the pain points are what what solutions you are providing to somebody else 
that is only ever going to be from the lens and filter of what your expectations of their, their problems are. They might interpret that in completely different ways or be able to utilize your solution set in very different ways for their own applications. And that's why um, when we were doing that cohort uh, mentorship for the, uh, the interviews were so important to go talk to 20 people and say, hey, we have the solution set. And somebody says, oh, well, that's not what we really need. The, the real pain point is this other thing. But if you have that MVP or even like your little cardboard mock-up and say, it can do this, then they can hold it, they can play with it. You engage all these other senses that say, oh, here's the thing that it does do. Let's use it for this too, because it can solve all these problems we didn't know we had. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Rebecca, you wanna riff on that? I know this is, this is where you live, right? Yeah, I was actually, I mean, I, I completely agree with what John's saying. And I was actually thinking about kind of this conversation in the comments about, you know, Henry Ford and people, you know, the idea of people not having imagination, right? They just want faster horses. Um, and then Steve Jobs as well. And, you know, and the idea that some of these innovations are truly, you know, transformative, whether to an industry or to like people's lives and things, but even, you know, say a smartphone, you know, we had a Palm Pilot and we had, Blackberries, you know, before Apple like totally like ran with it. So there was some level of iteration there as well. Um, and then just a comment on, on an earlier thing, just about um, separating yourself from your design. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Satyam uh, kind of made this comment like to detach yourself from the product. Um, and so kind of in, in our design circles at the Idea Forge, we talk about throwing away your design baby which is that first idea you have to solve a problem, that it's usually not gonna be the one that actually solves it, but it's a place to start that you can, can you know, move forward with. So a couple, maybe these are side notes, but. Perfect, and then uh, since you're up, would you like to kind of speak to the, the cycle of this, of the, the iterative learning with the MVP? Cycle, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it is a cycle and I think that, um, I mean, again, a lot of, especially the engineering students that I work with are very interested in problem solving. And the idea of going through the cycle many times is frustrating um, and it feels like it's inefficient, but that this is, you know, really part of the process um, and, you know, making sure to um, think of it as like that continual learning and that's how you're going to get to the part. Like it might hurt to get critical feedback, et cetera, but that learning is what's going to um, really help you move forward and make your product better. Cool. Um, John or Sally, you, either of you want to speak to that kind of running through this several times, the idea of, of learning from your MVP and then making a slightly better, different version? We iterate constantly with what we do, and we're always looking for ways both to improve our skills and to improve the offerings that we have. Um, so getting feedback from customers is very important, but um, it's kind of like Yelp reviews. Like you tend to hear negative things for feedback, not necessarily the positive ones. Um, so you might not really know how a thing is being used out in the field um, to really get a good grasp on that. So doing interviews, doing data points, doing feedback. Um, if you've got a product of some kind and it's like, a, and you're looking to iterate, offer your customers something like a free burger coupon or, you know, a $5 gift card or something uh, to make it worth their while because you can get good information. Out out of them, but they don't, they don't volunteer a lot of it. It's like, well, we need specifics on how to improve this thing. Yeah. I think that's key. And that's also why you need to have an idea of what you're trying to learn first. Not just like, did you like this thing, but did they use it correctly? Did it actually solve um, the problem? For us, we usually get a lot of, you know, we incorporate the, the little finicky thing. You're cutting in and out a little bit, so. <laughs> Sorry about that, John. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, We'll, we'll keep trying. So I know you all have a lot to say on this probably, and I'm gonna ask David to jump in too, and uh, maybe some other mentors are on the call. Um, Sally, do you wanna kick us off? <laughs> Only that this is so true. And I would, uh, I mean, I would, I, I'd have people raise their hands if they have not seen feature creep. 
because it is just, it's the bane of all of us trying to get out a product. Um, you know, as technologists and R&D designers and builders, we all want one more really cool bell and whistle. But if you don't listen to your customer, you're tending to over-design, to spend too much money, and to end up designing the wrong thing. So, uh, yeah, I would think most people in this room who've, who've been in a company have seen this problem. Rebecca, or actually David, uh, anything you want to share from personal experience or things you've seen? Yeah, boy, that, that uh, spec creep, that's, that's always a, a challenge. Um, you know, one, <laughs> I don't know, I guess one thing that pops to mind is one of the things that I've used to help control that uh, is, a, is a product development process. Now, it all depends on when the creep happens, but especially in smaller companies, it's really common to just, everybody's working on it, new idea comes up, you decide to throw it in, another new idea comes up, you decide to throw it in. Larger companies tend to have a process where you start off at the beginning, you define the scope, and then you go working through it and you, know, you freeze it at, at, at that step. And if something changes, you come back and start over. So there's, there's an inertia or better yet, there's a potential barrier to adding things. That can be useful even in a small team because it's that discipline of, look, we decided this is what we're going to go forward with. Let's get that to a certain point uh, before we start adding more things. Because it's just, it's such a tempting thing, even for those of us who know it's a bad idea. Some new idea comes up and you think, oh, yeah, yeah, we can throw that in, right? And But that's how you get out of hand. Yeah, definitely. And I think, sorry, I think, are you, are you then going back to that process? Or we just adding... asked, how can you... Go ahead, John. I think he was pointing out that Louise. Uh, Louise just asked in the comments, how can you measure the value? Uh, speaking to that, it's, uh, you know, if you see, if you hear something recurringly, that's usually a good indicator of potential success. If you customers all asking for the same thing, uh, as opposed to just the one who says this could be improved, People are always going to have ideas and going to be perfect. Something I can say is don't be afraid to put pins in some of those ideas and split your products too, because you might find that something is a good feature, but is not necessarily something you want to put into your MVP or even into your production model. But you can do value adds of plugins. You can do them as additional products or supplemental stuff. You create your own ecosystem of, you know, here's your, your MacBook, but also here's your, your genius bar for repairing the MacBooks too. So, you know, so you can, you can create your own solutions that uh, you essentially caused by not including the feature in the first place. And I think there's the opportunity, I mean, maybe this is likely before you get to that true MVP point, but for parallel prototyping, where you don't just have one thing that you're trying to do, but if you, if you want to test some of those features, you can have multiple prototypes addressing basically the same thing, but maybe with a few different features, and then narrow in on kind of more of a final solid MVP based on all the feedback and information you gather. I like that. So if someone has an idea in your team, okay, let's prove it. Let's prove this is worth for putting any time and money into. I'm curious, Sally, because uh, you're at a different level with your company or companies on this. You know, how do you how do you address this at scale? I mean, you're no longer in the trenches, like shooting people down. So how you know, how does this look as as a culture, as a team? In terms of features, of uh, keeping the the feature creep, you know. You have a whole suite of products and things and yeah, that, that, um, X, yeah. that is fascinating. And it, uh, to me, it is, it is the same thing in a big company as it is in i -Corp. It translates a little differently, but it's keeping your eye on the customer at all times. So in a larger com cust uh, company, you, you have to listen to the marketing team and to the biz dev team because they are going out and talking to the customer and reporting back to the technical team. Here's what we really need. Um, and then that has to be filtered as what we can really do versus what we can't really do. You always have that pushback from R&D saying, you know, you're asking for the moon, you're asking for the wrong stuff. But um, I'd love for Jim Pollack to jump in on this that, you know, to my, my experience is i -Corps asks for 100 interviews. And it is not a magic number, but it is a way of saying that you need to go out and talk to so many customers that you really validate with a large in of 
the, you know, which are the features, what are the needs of the customers? Are you really hitting the right things or are you overdeveloping? And uh, Jim, I know you've done about 77 interviews on your current project. Um, you know, are you dealing with feature creep and what to put on and take off the table? Yeah, well, actually, in my, in my sorted career, probably one of the, my favorite jobs of all time has been a product manager, where you have one foot in the customer's space, one foot in engineering. Um, and and I, I used to joke that the, the, the role of a product manager is to spend six months figuring out what features you needed to have, selling it to engineering, and then wait six months and then go sell what they actually built. And of course, that's not how it actually works. But yeah, I mean, like for us, as you talk to a lot of people, and then and the discipline, let me back up, the discipline of a product manager or someone who's responsible for the product, the discipline is to differentiate between what is what is that minimum viable product? What gets me to market and makes a happy customer with enough innovation to get them really excited about it? And drawing the line and saying these other things, we're not throwing them away. Those are future feature potentials and things. And so you just have to have that, you just have to have that discipline of being able to differentiate between what I actually need to have to get to market and what, what is it that I can save for future releases and things. And you always got to get your engineering team, get them out to, to trade shows, get them out to talk to customers themselves. It's amazing the, the mind change they have when they talk to a real customer and understand what the customer really wants. Hey, and Jim, let me ask you another question based on that. You're, you're doing that same role once again now with a CU technology. And what you're doing is out talking to the customer as the technology is still being investigated in the lab. And how is that affecting your investigation and your breadboard and your very early features? Well, that, that's actually a really fun part of, of what we're doing right now with them and Astra and, and working with the lab. Cause one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I want to work with Zoya Popovich and she's a brilliant person and she has a lot of brilliant ideas and things. And we want the relationship. I've done deals in the past where I've licensed software from a university. Um, and then basically it's almost arm's length. I, we picked up an algorithm, shook hands. Thanks. Talk to you later. And we've gone off and done our own thing. And that algorithm is a small part of the overall thing we're building. But right now, what we're building is 99% of it is going to be what she has invented. Uh, and we want to be in a position where we're not telling her what to do from research standpoint, but influencing what she does. And so we're taking all these inputs. We're keeping her very involved with and, and the PhD students she's working with, letting them you know, talk to a couple of customers themselves and make sure they're getting direct feedback from us and what we're hearing and where we want to do the trade-offs. But we're really trying to influence what they do to make sure that the research they're doing stays on track to something that is commercial, commercializable. That's, this is a, this can definitely be a painful piece of developing something. Um, and I think uh, to John's point, if you hear a theme of, of issues that people have is a good way to look at it. And then a good way to, t to test it out is does, you know, getting something in front of them, does that do what they want? Or is there a bunch of extra stuff they don't use? Um, and then to Rebecca's point, doing parallel development. So testing out things individually so you can actually know. Some of this, get, this is getting into like science that you all actually, you know, understand. Uh, I want to move a little bit quickly through this, a few of these slides. This one's a little blurry. blurry. Um, but the point of this is like sales are hard. Um, Sally mentioned earlier, she had a really awesome technology that they sold two of. And so, you know, you can get really excited um, and maybe make a couple sales based on, you know, interest or personal connections. But part of the MVP is figuring out, is this solving a core problem for the actual market? Even if you're still going to have early adopters, you know, is this something that has a bigger uh, potential? Any of you want to speak to that real quickly? All right, did you, I had missed, did you say? Yeah, if, if anyone want to yeah, speak sure. to this part of, you know, uh, getting those early sales. Um, yeah. And, and well, also bringing your team back down to reality. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's a few things, you know, actually what I was thinking of saying uh, before you mentioned that is uh, sales are hard. And this is actually one of the places where I have seen that scope creep because the salespeople come back and say, oh, if we just add this feature, I can sell some. And, you know, it's not exactly what you're asking here, but I think it's related uh, because it's, it's kind of a matter of, of trying to get, uh, trying to meet those, those sales uh, you know, targets or, or whatever the forecast is, maybe related to the inflated expectations actually as you start to get further on. And what I've actually seen is 
salesperson starts to uh, uh, develop, you know, get, get to be friends with the engineering team and kind of on the sides, like, can, can you just give me a version of this, a variant with this extra feature? Just take, how long will that take? Nothing? Okay, yeah, get it to me and I'll get it out. And you, know, you kind of, engineers are supposed to innovate. We, they like to innovate. And so it's real easy for that to happen while everyone else is not realizing what's going wrong. And so I think this is one of the drivers for that. That's what actually comes to my mind. Uh, and it, it's, it's kind of going after perhaps a wider range of maybe the green, the innovators of the early adopters to try and spread the market. But unfortunately, it's also destroying the focus. And it doesn't help you get across the chasm because you're not really focusing on that one group. That's, that's what I think when I see this. Yeah, I think, and we see a lot with, uh, with faculty research where there's a bunch of interested parties that all want some custom solution of whatever they're doing. Yeah. Um, and that can totally uh, kill an early business. You know, that's something to watch out for. Absolutely, and actually one of the places you can see that is when uh, the customer base is considered to be university researchers. That happens with technical products because then, you know, they, they talk about it at a level that it seems like everybody wants the same thing, but when they actually get into developing what they need, somehow it's different enough that they have all these different variants, and right there you've, you've diluted your focus. Yeah. I'm going to keep moving. I think we want to have time for questions. Um, so we kind of talked about this, but there's a lot of discussion in MVP, but kind of the way that we've been looking at it, you need to have a thing, right? What are you actually delivering as value to specific customers and specific jobs to be able to find these people? How are you gonna get it to them? How do they usually buy things? How are they delivered? And then what kind of relationship do you have? So John mentioned, you know, do you buy them a burger or something so that you can get that feedback, but making sure you have that channel um, and so those are really the core pieces. And the, for those of you familiar with the business model canvas, this is a lot of the right side of the canvas. Um, looking at you know, metrics that matter. So you're going into this and MVP, like a lot of your early uh, parts is a test, is a way to learn more and de-risk your business. Um, I don't know, Sally, if you wanna to speak to this real quick, what kinds of things are you looking for to learn from, from an MVP? Um, yeah, and I wanna, I wanna combine with this, uh, Michael Marshak uh, in the chat um, asked the question, and I'm just going to combine these. Of Can someone discuss the value and cost of rushing out imperfect beta products for immediate customer feedback versus waiting for a more complete and fin polished product? Um, how do decisions like this change in different industries? If anybody has comments on that, please throw them in the chat. Chris Singer, you might have a real interesting perspective on that. Um, I, will, I will throw out that... Um, I think that everybody has this question of how polished and how perfect does it have to be? And my experience is that typically uh, uh, an R&D team tries to make it um, more perfect than it needs to be, um, but there's a, that, there's a counterbalance to that. So for instance, in biotech, I mean, you simply can't less than a functioning product. So that's why I was saying to me, in my mind, I think at least today, I would argue that there is no such thing as an MVP or a hack version of an FDA approved product. Um, I would say that there is a minimum proof of concept that your customer needs to see. And the question is figuring out from talking to them, what is it they need? So my example is an oil and gas team I worked with um, who had an additive that you put into the pipeline. So the ENP, the upstream pipeline from the field to the refinery, you put in this additive and it would stop the corrosion of the crude oil flowing down the pipeline. It would reduce it, which could mean, you know, saving huge costs and for the oil and gas company. The uh, customers whom they went to talk to about this said, are you out of your mind? We don't care how good your chemical might be. We're not about to put it in our pipeline. And, you know, this is, this is billions of dollars worth of value for us, and you are not messing with our pipeline. However, when they went down to Port Arthur, um, they were able to find a micro refinery that had a test bed refinery where they willing to put the chemical in the pipe and try it in the pipe and see what happened there. So to me, that became an MVP for them on a small scale 
of something that might go big in the large scale, but that was never going to be tried by an Exxon or somebody in the field. I think that's a that's a great example, Sally. We'll keep moving. I, I know Rebecca has a lot around this too. Um, so, oh, sorry, I didn't know that was a moving GIF. Uh, so, what are some common pitfalls you see with MVP? Um, we'll start with Rebecca and then run to John um, and try to wrap this up soon. Um, well, what, what I have to say is kind of related to that question that Sally was just talking about as well. And, and again, depending on what your product is, um, if you wait until something is too perfect, um, you might just be missing what your customers need or the change. Like you're building something that you think they need, or maybe you don't have enough information. And if something, and again, like maybe I'm thinking about more like consumer products, but if you put something in front of a customer that looks very, very um, finished and complete, um, users aren't able to provide you, like they might not be willing or able to provide you feedback because it's already set. You know what I mean? If you hand it to them as cardboard, they could be like, oh, well, it could do this and it could do this and it could do this because they're not worried about like things that aren't possible because everything's possible because it's made out of cardboard or, you know, and maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but if you put something that's too polished, you might've missed boat and you might not be getting really valuable user experience or user feedback because you're too far along for that feedback to matter. So, you know, it's a, it's a balance um, for sure. Uh, to to make a counterpoint to what Rebecca just said, make sure that the people that you are testing with are open to seeing works in progress. Um, sometimes when they see behind the curtain and they're like, oh, we thought this product was a lot further ahead than it really is. Um, understanding that it is an iterative process and that it is a work in progress. Um, let them, like you wanna find people that you can trust to see it uh, in a, a under construction state. I've had some people that have soured on the idea because it's like, okay, well, we see how little this can do relative to what, you know, big, big price solution would cost. Um, therefore, we see how the sausage is getting made and we don't want any part of this later on. So find people who are just okay with mis mistakes being made. Um, another common pitfall I would say is uh, feature creep for sure. Just like, make sure that you are talking with the person for their solution set and that you are actually addressing their problem. Because sometimes you can think that you're hitting that solution and still be missing the mark. And then they, you give it to them and they get frustrated because they say, oh, this still doesn't solve the actual problem that we've had. And again, imagination is big. Explain to them all the ways that it can be valuable to them and identify what they actually perk up at. Uh, you know, if, if they're not holding the thing in their hands, if you say, what if I had XYZ features and they only kind of light up at Y, you know, just kind of take that as the, well, that is the pain point that we really need to solve. Even if they have these other ones, the ones that they get emotionally invested in solving are useful feedback points. All right, um, Sally or John, you wanna talk about this really quickly? I'm sorry, we're running out of time. Just, uh, you know, how to actually prototype something. Yeah, uh, so we run a prototyping, uh, shop. We are down in Broomfield. Uh, we work with a lot of uh, people who just come to us with ideas. Um, there are a lot of design firms. If you type in Invention Studio, like you will find places that specialize in uh, the necessary skills to get either mock-ups or to get things ready for production. So if you don't have the skill set, but you do have the idea, don't let that stop you from actually moving forward on a product. It, however, just gets a little more expensive because um, you have to pay someone for CAD work usually, but you know, with the, the internet being what it is, if you're trying to do things on the cheap, sites like Fiverr are fantastic, or Elancer, uh, for finding people who have the skill sets to do your 3D CAD work, to do your graphic design, to do your, you know, your pretty brochure for your investor pitch. Um, you just have to have the idea and you just need to give some of these people a direction. You need to have a good eye for quality and kind of a good eye for what it is that you need the finished result to be, as well as being able to communicate that. Um, so that's one way to really get things done on the cheap is to find uh, something on Fiverr or a freelance site to make those kinds of products 
ready for at least your MVP phase. Um, another extremely valuable resource, contact your local hacker spaces. A lot of these people d love interesting projects. And even if your project isn't necessarily interesting, um, they can at least help you do what you need to, whether you need to use the CNC or the laser cutter, or you know, if you need somebody who has this very specific skill set, um, you can usually make connections at the hacker spaces in order to uh, at least facilitate a prototype if you're looking for something uh, um, uh, physical. If it's something digital, um, another good place is uh, just post projects around um, the, the campuses. Sometimes people are looking for cash. Um, sometimes people need uh, good ideas for senior capstone projects. You can hire people at CU to do like fund and sponsor their projects and they can do them for their senior theses. Uh, that's another good way to get some research done uh, fairly on the cheap and then they get their, their you know, postdoc out of it. Perfect. And just to, just to point out, Rebecca, you know, helps manage and is is virtually in one of those spaces right now. Um, super fun, multiple levels, all kinds of toys and cool equipment. Um, and I think the biggest point is the, the mentality and the framework to help you actually get a prototype and MVP. Uh, let's keep running. Um, so this is a whole other conversation. Our next uh, section is actually on getting funding. I think sometimes people use an MVP, especially in biotech or other, not maybe not biotech, but as a way to attract funders or prove that they're ready for investment. Um, and then I wanna highlight some upcoming events. So Pitch Academy, uh, we're kind of full for the workshop phase unless you're in LVC or other upcoming pitch event, but we have a one hour, 45 minute uh, coaching uh, workshop session with Cindy Staliki, who's an expert in this, that will be great. Um, so sign up online. Uh, Rebecca already mentioned, but coming up next is a demystifying entrepreneurship prototyping event as part of MVC. This is actually a chair I made uh, and Daria, the director is sitting on it, uh, was, was super fun and it was a great way to like get into the whole process about something that you're not as emotionally tied to, right? Um, Colin, Colin, it was a seating experience. Seating, oh man, see? <laughs> it's so easy to fall into the, the same mental model. So, and that's why they're great about this. They live and breathe this every day. Um, and then uh, MVC kickoff is coming up really soon. If you're not familiar with that, check it out. Huge campus-wide event opportunities for tons of people, tons of workshops. Um, Lab Venture Challenge is coming up in November. Um, this will be virtual. We have a lot of great teams with promising technology who are gonna pitch um, and kind of move forward. And I think that's the end. Uh, Sally, you wanna close this out? Uh, sure, I'll just thank everybody for coming. Um, great to see you virtually. Um, and please do reach out with us if you've got ideas, if you've got more questions, we're happy to talk about this. I'll leave you with one final thought, which is don't forget your competition. You know, your minimum viable product has to be made in context of what everybody else is doing. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Some of us will stay around if you have questions. Sorry we didn't get as much time as I planned uh, for questions. Uh, thanks to our speakers, Rebecca, John, and Sally, and then David and Jim for jumping in and kind of sharing their expertise. Have a great day, everyone. We're sticking around for Q&A. Yeah, if you don't mind, just for a few minutes, if anyone has any. Sure. Um, and I imagine some people might hit you up. Uh, I actually I have a, a point that I wanted to make uh, when we were discussing future. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to specialize too. So uh, I, I think a lot of us, when we're doing this, we're looking at what is the most universal solution mm -hmm. for the broadest section of market share that you can possibly get. Uh, when doing that, if you find a company that you really want to work with and work for and, and kind of uh, solve their problems, the, it, it is far easier to maintain a relationship than it is to start a new one. And uh, I worked at a company that did manufacturing of data storage vaults. And they had tons and tons of weird, wonky software that they had developed specifically for this one customer that just kept buying up all of their storage vaults. And so it made sense to cater to their needs and to build a, a working relationship with them because they were the ones who were ultimately paying the bills. If you find something that works, like your job is to find is like to make a living. Like that's what we are doing with your products at the end of the day. It's like changing the world and or making a living. If you can do one or both, you know, find the solution that actually fits those pain points rather than trying to make the, you know, the Facebook or making a, a, a unicorn IPO. Uh, find what works for you and what solves your financial goals. That's a great point, John. Good point.